the opportunity to say a few words on alternative strategies um, is important to me. And I say alternative strategies because hedge funds, well, they may not have endeared themselves to investors en masse, especially lately. I don't know if any of you saw the dust up on CNBC the other day between uh, Bill Ackman and, and Carl Icahn, uh, two heavyweights in the he hedge fund industry. It, it's, needless to say, it wasn't pretty, but uh, as my analyst Wendy described it, uh, Jerry Springer for the 1%. <laughs> Bad press aside, for diversification, good hedge funds should not be ignored. The, uh, the, the uh, and this is where I changed my uh, speech here a little bit, so I, I'm gonna make two main points tonight. And first, I believe the majority of Canadians suffer from a serious lack of diversification, and this is a potential to become a problem in the not too distant future. Second, Alternative funds, otherwise known as hedge funds to a large extent, focus on absolute returns and should be considered by investors as a way to address the lack of diversification. The, uh, to give you an example, I was in London last year and I was trying to raise assets for my offshore. And in regards to diversification in Canada, I was trying to explain Canada to this rather stately Englishman. I said to him, you have to understand that the Canadian market is comprised of five banks, a couple of telephone companies, a utility, a drugstore, and 3,000 resource stocks. And uh, it's when he, he lifted his head up from his notes and said, young man, you forgot the donut shop. <laughs> and I know I'm missing a few pipelines and REITs, but, but uh, anyways, I added the donut shop to the next presentation. The, the, my simple point is the lack of diversification to our Canadian equity markets is structural in nature. Financials and energy represent 57% of the TSX composite, leaving Canadians with a, a serious concentration issue. Speaking of financials, I, I found this interesting. Uh, I mean, I lived it and witnessed it, but it's kind of interesting to see that both housing and uh, this chart kind of piques my interest, the correlation between banks and residential real estate. There, there are many factors involved in here, but call me Sherlock Holmes, I think interest rates are, uh, are involved. Um, both these banks, Royal and TD, and, and all the bank charts in Canada look uh, fairly similar, were pretty sleepy investments for most of the 80s and early 90s. Then in 1996, both became much more volatile and started to sprint higher. Long-term rates, had been in steady decline from about 16% in the early 80s to around 8% uh, in 1996. I don't know if you can see that in the back there, but, uh, and then in 96, Mr. Greenspan at the helm of the US Central Bank, rates started to drop uh, dramatically, and Canadian housing and financial stocks go in the op opposite direction with uh, somewhat similar velocity. Many Canadians have prospered significantly from the boom in housing prices and the long-term rally in bank stocks. Maybe it's time to diversify a little. I smile when I say this because Royal Bank hit an all-time high today. I'm not saying that rates are going higher and both housing and bank stocks are going to fall. In fact, at some point in our lifetime, rates might go up because the economy is strong. And many people will obviously argue that housing and banking will do just fine in that environment. But I will say that after consulting with my American, Irish, and Spanish friends, that if housing falters significantly, so will our banks. Even if the bank stocks do not keep you up at night, I just hope I've made you a little more aware by this chart of how concentrated and correlated your investments may be. And this is without any discussion of corporate bonds, government bonds, and commodity sens sensitivity to interest rates. Moving to my second point, and this is where the speech perhaps gets a little promotional, it shows uh, SWH's lack of correlation to down equity markets. Everybody likes uncorrelated returns in down markets. The slide shows how we have fared in the worst five months for both the S&P and the TSX since our inception, April 1st, 2010. At least you can say we're not closet indexers. That's uh, one thing you'd say from this chart. So the question I would ask if I looked at this is, is how do you do it? How do you avoid losses and profit, uh, avoid losses and or profit in down markets? For starters, you need to structure your portfolio so you always have some kind of downside protection in place. We use out of the money put positions. It also helps 
if you have a portfolio that has some combination of longs and shorts to contain your risk to market direction. Liquidity is another critical element. Being able to go to cash or change your exposure dramatically and quickly is very important. And finally, and this one is extremely important, avoid crowded trades. We might not be right in avoiding energy and financials because the consensus view does not always have to be wrong. But we do know that in avoiding these sectors and looking for op profit opportunities elsewhere, we will provide uncorrelated absolute returns that will pl play an important part of a diversified portfolio. Hedge funds play a minor role in most Canadians' investment portfolios, but this is going to change dramatically in the next five years because Canadians really need the diversification and good hedge funds are one of the few investment alternatives that can provide it. I just hope it's not another financial crisis that makes everybody realize it. Thanks for your time, Dave. I think about five and a half minutes, but maybe I got there at five. But uh, thanks for your time. And, and now over to John Muldoon, where we all look forward to hearing his thoughts from the front line. <laughs>